Pardon, please. Perfect. So it is a honor for myself to welcome you, everybody, to the, the fourth day of this series of talks in the honor of Professor Ramirez Arellano. This time we're going to begin with a master talk by Professor Joseph Kohn of the University of Princeton, and the title is Solution of the PDF and Resolution of Singularities. So please, Professor Kohn, begin. Bueno, muchas gracias. Uh, primero tengo que agradecer a todos los que organizaron esta magnífica reunión celebrando uh, las grandes contribuciones del profesor Ramírez, no solo en la investigación, pero también como maestro y administrador. Uh, uh, tengo que... Uh, me da pena uh, que no puedo estar presente en México, pero el Zoom me da la oportunidad de recordar los viejos tiempos. Ahora voy a continuar en inglés. Um, please be patient. I have some health issues, so please bear with me if I continue, if I, if I have coughing incidents during this presentation. Under these circumstances, I'm uh, very grateful to my friends, professors Tony Barry and John D'Angelo for their invaluable help in preparing this talk. Um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to speak in honor of Professor Enrique Ramirez de Arellano. This occasion brings back many wonderful memories of my frequent visits to Mexico. The first time I visited was in the summer of 1954. I was a graduate student in Princeton when Professor Solomon Lefschetz, the chairman of the math department, found out that I speak Spanish. He recruited, maybe mejor dicho, ordered me to come to Mexico to help out with some of the administrative work and translation. At that time, Jose Adem was a postdoc in Princeton and he asked me to lecture on chief theory in Mexico. This theory was being developed in France and in Germany. And that semester, we learned the latest developments in a seminar given by Moore, Spencer, and Kodaira. Uh, when, uh, let's see. When I entered in the, when I entered in the uh, UNAM to give my first lecture, the room was packed. With Lefschetz sitting in the front row, he told me, don't talk about this newfangled sheaf theory. Stick to the basics of classical several complex variables. <laughs> Adem was sitting in the back row and I went over to him for help. He said, don't worry, start your lecture with some generalities. After two minutes, Lefschetz will be sound <laughs> asleep and you can say anything you wish. <laughs> This worked very well. Now, I'm not the, histor the historian Michael Range is. However, inspired with his talk, I will give it a try. Complex analysis from the middle of the 19th century was developed in two directions. The first pursued by Weierstrass studies the holomorphic functions that are solutions of the homogeneous equations d bar h equals zero by integral representations and power series. Pardon? What? Am I, on, am I on all right? The second pursued by Riemann is to study the inhomogeneous equation d bar u equal alpha and the dependence of u on alpha to derive properties of holomorphic functions from this dependence. In several complex variables, the first approach leads both to sheaf theory and integral representation. Okay. Ramirez. Me uh, oyen? Yes, I, indeed, Professor, don't worry. Somebody is talking into this. 
Yeah, it's, it was on the, somebody just left open the microphone, but it's already now. Okay, okay. Ramirez and Henkin are major contributors to this approach. The second approach was initiated by Riemann with his amazing use of the Dirichlet principle to uh, study conformal mappings. In several complex variables, this approach uh, led, uh, I have to move this around. This approach led Hodge, um, so leads to Hodge theory on compact manifolds and to basic theorems in the theory of elliptic PD. For example, the, the vial lemma and the Gordon inequality. DC Spencer adopted this approach to formulate the D-bar Neumann problem, which has been my area of research. Given a compact complex manifold M prime with boundary M, the problem is, if alpha is a square integral of zero, one, four, one, and prime, find conditions for, uh, for existence of a function u orthogonal to the holomorphic function, such as d bar u equal alpha, and study the dependence of u on alpha. Let's see. Ah, this thing doesn't move so nicely. Um, Okay, now about the D-bar normal problem. <clears throat> this problem can be formulated, formulated as follows. We want to find a zero one form phi, such that u equal D-bar star phi. So remember, we wanted to have find u so that D-bar u equal alpha, but now we further want to find phi so that u equal D-bar star phi, where D-bar star denotes the L2 uh, adjoint so phi satisfies the boundary con a boundary condition. And so of course, it's now automatically orthogonal to the homomorphic functions. Thus, we want to solve the equation d bar equal d bar star phi equal alpha with d bar alpha equal zero. But d bar alpha equal zero implies, uh, oh boy, I, this is jumbled here. I say d bar alpha equals zero implies the d bar alpha. Oh, d bar, <coughs> that's correct. <coughs> so, sorry. Then, <coughs> then d bar alpha equals zero implies the d bar phi equals zero. The solution of this equation is automatically, automatically satisfies the equation when you add, you're, I'm adding this piece, which is, which for our phi is zero, but, if you add this, then this operator here, do you see them pointing? What am I pointing to with this thing or not? Probably not. The operator square. Um, yes, we can see it, Professor. Don't worry. You can see the pointer? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, so this operator um, uh, equal alpha, uh, this part just vanishes, so it's, uh, so we are solving this new equation. But now we don't have to put any conditions on alpha. And we know that if d bar alpha equals zero, that'll solve what we want. So we'll look at this this new equation. That's the d bar, that's, that's what's called the d bar norm problem. Now, this operator is elliptic in the interior of the domain, but it has boundary conditions, which are imposed by the fact that phi has to be in the domain of the adjoint of d bar and d bar phi has to be in the domain of the adjoint of d bar. Those are complicated boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions are not elliptic. So, um, so uh, what we do is we do the usual things as they do in, uh, in fluid mechanics. Uh, you cook up a energy form like this, and then uh, we have a variational principle and the, uh, we can reformulate the whole problem by, by given alpha, uh, find, uh, resolve this equation. And you can do that, that with, if you happen to have this estimate, then by standard arguments, you can find a fee which, which do this. And, 
if you want to have and, and, and smoothness, additional smoothness is gotten if you have this estimate on the epsilon. Uh, you can see what I'm pointing to, right? I hope. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, from the first estimate, we can conclude the existence in L2. And from the second, when epsilon is greater than zero, the solution phi is smoother than alpha by epsilon. That means in the sobel left sense. These estimates hold only under certain conditions on M. The second estimate for, uh, I've got, sorry, I should have been a dollar sign here. This is epsilon equal one half, holds if and only if M is strongly pseudo-convex. That's what's proven by Mori. Using this result, Hormander proved that the first estimate uh, meant for any domain of holomorphy, the first estimate for any domain of holomorphy, and I proved the smoothest property when epsilon equal one half. Sorry about not putting, missing the integral sign here. But as I say, this is an earlier version. I lost the first version uh, anyway. So, so then Nirenberg and I uh, started working on this and we proved uh, the property for epsilon greater than zero. So we know that if that estimate for epsilon greater than zero holds, then you have the smoothness. So the question now is when, for what kind of domain? So, so anyway, uh, to prove the thing for one half, for the one half, you need a condition called strongly pseudo-convex. And in Hormann, the general has very general things which are uh, uh, the existence for very general things which are uh, which are just homo domains of holomorphy. Uh, but uh, I proved this thing for the smoothness for epsilon equal one half. And then with Nuremberg, we proved that if the estimate uh, epsilon is greater than zero holds, then, uh, then there's uh, additional, the, the necessary smoothness. Now the uh, the proof of this, so this is, there are two two points about this. First of all, um, these strongly pseudo convex domains are well known, and one can approximate them with the Heisenberg group, and everything is known what they look like. But epsilon, but these things which where where epsilon is not one half, but only epsilon, where uh, but only greater than zero. There, it's a mystery. What what are what are these things are? What kind of geometry is it? And it's that point that I wanted to. Uh, uh, this talk is based on that we can uh, that we can associate the calculations of this to properties of uh, complex analytic varieties. That's the that's sort of the point of the talk. And uh, I apologize if the thing is not too well written down, but we'll we'll figure it out. So here is a picture. This appeared in a conference in Berkeley. Uh, this is a domain that Nuremberg and I cooked up, which is given here. This is a boundary. This is the function that defines the boundary of a domain. And this this is very strange. This boundary is um, this domain is uh, what we call finite type, uh, very simple, and. Uh, Turns out fairly simple to prove that um, you can have an estimate with epsilon equal one eighth, so you have all the smoothness. However, uh, it has a strange property that if you you know that the the, the solution of the of the equation for the domain is going to be given by some kind of kernel, and one would like to find out. If this kernel has some nice properties, etc., or, or what it is, and derive derive uh, things from that. However, Nuremberg and I proved, and the reason we cooked up this domain is that there is no separating function. That you have this domain uh, sitting uh, uh, sitting in CN with the origin uh, on the boundary. And uh, any holomorphic function in any little neighborhood of the origin, uh, which is zero at the origin, 
will automatically be zero, both inside and outside the domain. So there's no, now what these people, what the, these uh, kernels, uh, these kernel representation uh, usually requires in order to prove estimates of the, uh, is to have a, uh, a function in the denominator, which is a separating function, which that is it's zero at the point at the origin say, and it's different from zero outside the domain. Uh, you know, I mean, it's different from zero inside the domain. So it separates, the zero separate the domain. Um, and such a function does not exist. So what, uh, so now there has been uh, some real progress in understanding these matters. This, is, this poses a kind of a, a funny um, problem in PDE uh, that you have this kind, of, this kind of situation where you cannot find the right, you cannot do it the right way with a, with a usual kernel function. But uh, recently in a, in a remarkable preprint, uh, Grunmeier and uh, Stensonis proved uh, supernormal estimates for domains of finite type, which I'll say later, in C3 without using integral formulas. And this will appear, I'm very happy to say that this will appear in an issue in the Chinese Pure and Applied Mathematics quarterly that's been, uh, that's being issued in my honor. So uh, I wanted to call attention to that paper. Um, okay, now uh, what happens is that we have, I'm just gonna talk instead of trying to read it because of my side of the, my, all my other problems, my research is so good. So anyway, um, the, um, so, so the deep Neumann problem consists of, um, you have to have some complicated boundary conditions and uh, closely related to it, you, uh, you have this, uh, this elliptic operator with complicated boundary conditions. And in addition, the estimates are sort of funny because you have a sub F norm on a, on a domain with boundary, you know, so you have, you can only on the boundary you're going to take tangential derivatives, tangential Fourier transforms, and you, know, you have all this kind of stuff and all sorts of technicalities. So uh, what uh, Rossi and I did uh, was to sort of translate this problem so that we can just work on the boundary. And it turns out that there is a that the boundary is what's called a CR manifold. It's uh, the abstract form of the boundary. And uh, on it, we can use an operator, which, I call, which we call D bar B instead of D bar, and then D bar B star, which now is the adjoint according to the L2 norm in the boundary. And then we use this operator um, square sub B, um, which is uh, corresponds to the energy form just on the boundary, even like this, and everything, all the other setup that I've mentioned before is analogous. Now, we, what we do is that, in particular, now to connect it with uh, with complex and uh, with geometry. So suppose we start with any complex analytic variety V, uh, uh, which is given by a bunch of holomorphic functions in, in CN, H1 equal H2 equal, uh, equal zero, uh, zeros of a bunch of functions, um, which are holomorphic uh, in a neighborhood of the origin in CN. Okay, so now um, we have, uh, we're, we're, what we're gonna do is cook up a special uh, domain given by a defining function R, which is which I wrote down here. It's square, it's, it, it, this is in CN plus one, and these functions, squares of the functions in CN like this. And look, here's the, here's the picture. Of course, I must say this picture is completely wrong, but I, I, I trust that everybody, you know, the, the inside is, I mean, should be 
things should be pointing different ways and so on. But you get you get the picture. This, this is this is the this is the r the r equals zero, and that goes off to infinity. And we take a m prime a a domain which looks like this more or less coincides with r near the origin. And uh, we're going to be concerned only what happens around the origin. Um, so, you know, so the, the Hormann of the global estimate, this is uh, our domain of holomorphy will apply. And then everything else, all the smoothness stuff will apply only for things around here. Okay. So, uh, here, what am I saying here? Now, as I say, I have I have worked for hours on this this morning to perfect this talk, but but somehow right now I have troubles because it seems to be coming up twice. Anyway, somehow things are. Anyway, um, you. Nah. How does this work? I don't know how to get rid of it. What do you want to do, Professor? <laughs> I've got this picture which I've got to get. Okay, rid of. just put, put the, your cursor in the middle of the screen. How am I going to get rid of this picture now? Okay. Just put the cursor in the middle of the screen in the green bar. On this thing? On the green bar, no, below, below. A little below. below. Exactly in the border between the two pictures. Well, really? Click the border between the two pictures. Yeah, okay. A little low. Oh, there we are. And now what do I do with this stuff? No, that is, just put the, the cursor in the border, there. Yeah. Exactly there. And then up, 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 or down, up. Up. Up, even up. more up. Ah, I'm sorry. Oh boy, now it disappeared. Now I'll never find it again. Okay, well. What am I gonna do now? Click this off, maybe, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, what am I going to do? It's crazy, this is going to drive me crazy. Um, okay, now what? Am I Just move down the, this picture. Yeah. Just click on it. Okay, and then you can move it up. Okay, well, okay, here, maybe, maybe we can. Uh, it's a little lower. Here we are, we are again with this thing. This picture doesn't want to go away. How do I get it? Uh, can I move this thing up? Okay, you just click on it. No, no, click on the border in the green, in the gray part. In the, which part here? Exactly there. Click on it. Exactly. Click. click, no, now click. Click on it. Click on what? Just I, put the cursor exactly in the gray, in the gray line. Oh, here. On the gray line, exactly. Oops, going the other way. Or maybe yeah. this Yeah, down, down, down. Even uh, more down. Yeah, that's okay. Now what? You get right, now you can move the screen without any problem. <laughs> you can continue with your presentation, perfect. Oh, well, let's say you, you really know these things. These computers are maddening. Anyway. Uh, by the way, this is the first. This is the first talk I'm giving on Zoom. So uh, yeah. anyway, I don't know what I'm doing. So anyway, so here's a basic fact. Suppose there is a complex variety of dimension Q, which I'm going to just use. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to use consider the case where we have not a function of C of Q, Q, where Q equals just a function. So just as before. So, um, okay. I, I, this is a little mixed up, but anyway. Um, take a zero one form which is zero and is smooth in the neighborhood of the origin, we will give uh, 
uh, conditions as a function which uh, satisfies d by u equals zero and you're orthogonal to the space of homomorphic functions is smoother than, uh, than alpha in the neighborhood. It's, so, the, the, so this is the condition. So here are the results that you is smoother. The, the result here is that it is smoother in the origin if and only if V, now I, I should have it in the script V, if and only the variety is just, uh, just zero. So in this situation, did I have the picture already of this of this thing, or it will come later? I have a picture, but uh, maybe it comes later. Oh, did I have a picture of the variety yet? Uh, oh, I had a nice picture here, but it seems to be no. Well, never mind. So anyway, um, let's continue. Um, Anyway, so you, we have to have the, the necessary and sufficient condition for smoothness is that this, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the place where the, uh, where R goes to zero, uh, the, the, the variety that I wrote down, is uh, only zero when you intersect with that. I um, mean, you can see it here on this thing here. So the only, it only touches uh, uh, at zero. If, if the variety lies, if they were flatter and lies in there, then you would, uh, wouldn't have any smoothness. That's sort of necessary and sufficient in this case. But now you have to be a little more quantitative and. That's what, uh, that's uh, the thing I want to consider here. Sorry about this. Oh my God. Oh, there we are. Okay, uh, here. So the, the thing is that um, uh, the big breakthrough in all this understanding was made by Catlin with the use of a tool which was developed by D'Angelo for the uh, finite type. And he says that if you have a, you think, you try, and uh, so this is a point, you have this uh, pseudo convex domain and you have a point and you want to find out about regularity of this problem at that point. So what you do is pass all uh, of all functions, uh, just, just of the problem that I'm talking about, functions. So you pass all um, possible uh, complex analytic curves through that point. And if you can't get too close to the domain, then you have, uh, if uh, something lies, if the curve actually lies in domain or gets infinitely close, <laughs> then you <coughs> don't have good regularity properties. But if it touches at a point and sort of stays, the best curve stays separated, then you do. And the way that it was proven by in this remarkable paper by Catlin was he proved it with this kind of condition necessary and sufficient by the theory of finite type de developed by D'Angelo. This is quite 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 a inter very interesting theory, which is also should be uh, part of. Uh, I mean, my, my whole point of this lecture is to somehow call attention to these various facts and the recent work, my, my own recent work and other recent work to show that this analysis <laughs> uh, brings out all sorts of interesting uh, facts about, compl uh, about complex analytic varieties. Uh, uh, one of which is, uh, uh, a kind of a resolution of the singularity, and which is quite different from the usual one, but I think eventually will be proved to be the same or will imply the, the usual is finer. So um, just to depart from the script, usually you have, when you have a, a complex analytic variety, uh, which, uh, which has a point singularity, then the, 
algebraic geometers will say, well, gee, this is, uh, there's this wonderful Nusch-Sanzatz, which tells you that everything is smooth and you have, a, you actually, this singularity, for, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, so, so if a function is zero somewhere, uh, and, it's, uh, and, it's, and the Jacobians vanish and all that, it still um, uh, can be, uh, by the Nusselin, that's can be described as a nice smooth point. Uh, in this treatment, we uh, take these singularities very quantitatively and we say, no, uh, we have to resolve it still in some way. We have to, there is no, it, it's it's not from this algebraic point of view. It's it's a little uh, this kind of theory is takes that into account, and then in higher dimensions uh, similarly. So we have a kind of a resolution which involves uh, uh, more uh, several properties, I would say, and uh, hopefully this may clarify the whole whole situation of uh, the resolution of singularities of, uh, of uh, uh, complex analytic varieties. Anyway, um, here is, um, so here's some history, I don't know. Uh, so I, I wrote this in, I wrote these things in a paper for Eta Mathematica, which uh, proves uh, my original proof in, uh, sort of takes care of this uh, uh, approach. So yeah, so I, so D'Angelo has this D'Angelo type and I introduced a different kind of type called the ideal type. And um, I proved that that approach with ideal type uh, works is, is, uh, is sufficient uh, for, uh, for uh, subrepic estimates on any kind of uh, uh, pseudo convex domain. But, um, uh, and I also proved that it's necessary and sufficient for the type of uh, thing that we are doing, dealing with here. Then um, Diedrich and Fornes uh, enabled me to uh, prove the theorem, which enabled me to generalize that to manifolds with complex real complex boundaries. But the uh, trouble was, now you, what, 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 I, the trouble was that it still didn't give the real nice quantitative situation that the D'Angelo type ha has. So uh, that has led to all sorts of research. And um, there are very uh, deep papers about this by Sue and by Kim and Zaitsev. Um, Okay, I don't know, uh, something's screwed up here, but okay. So let me, let me just, just do a little bit of mathematics here. So uh, mathematically, we write down these, if you, uh, if you have a defining function uh, R and you write down these, this, this vector field Li, this will be a vector field on M and uh, uh, and if we write down our our variety, our special function, then it will look like this. And uh, and now there's this. So there are these n vector fields, and then these are and they're conjugates. Uh, they sort of look like complex things, but they're on they're vector fields on on M. But then there's the vector field T, which is uh, sort of uh, a direction which is not covered by these. So the setup is that in some ways, the, these things are to, you can, you can sort of think of these things as being something like elliptic in their own, in their own region. And T is something that's orthogonal, but nevertheless, these guys, they're commutators, commutators of the L's and the L bars, in some way should recover T. Now, the point is that commutators work very well when you're dealing with domains in C2. 
but beyond that, you have to use something more general than commentators. Uh, so let me just say, so um, let's see. Uh, so there's some formulas here where we show how, uh, see, you, you can estimate, you can write down uh, this bar in terms of these numbers with this kind of term here. Now, this term could be positive or negative. Uh, so you don't have an inequality really, but there's some something. So the thing is that we use a micro localization in order to look at those pieces of the Fourier transform of U on which this is positive and those pieces on which is negative. So that's, I explained this here, but I think probably it's too messy to give in a talk. But anyways, that, uh, right here, what we do is we, I have a picture actually, which is probably better. Yeah, here's a picture. Okay, so here, this is the, this is the bad direction T. And I'm gonna look at uh, a cutoff, uh, uh, sorry, no, I'm sorry. This is the Fourier transform space. So we are dealing, we are in, um, um, I'm sorry, this should be plus one here. All uh, right, or two N, no, I'm not. Yeah, anyway, we're, we're in C N plus, no, I'm sorry, we're in, on the boundary, which is a, a two and plus one dimensional manifold. Now what is happening here? Yeah. So um, we, have, we put in a cutoff function in the Fourier transform space, which corresponds to the, to the vector field T. And we want to separate the positive from the negative part. So this function is, this cutoff function is one around here and then it's zero outside here. And we take, uh, we, so we take a, a function, take its Fourier transform and multiply it by this function chi. Then, and then go back uh, and take the inverse Fourier transform. That is the micro localization to this particular region. And we sort of say, these things are really equivalent no matter what the region, no matter what, as long as you have a region here, it could, could be way up in there where this is one. And this doesn't matter. Uh, if you have less, so, so the microorganization is really a kind of a equivalence of all these kind of uh, things. And um, uh, that's the microorganization to zero thing. Then uh, if you flip it down, the minus one looks just like the minus of this diagram. That's the chi minus. And then the rest of the thing is uh, things that vanish in these two critical parts. And that, that is the elliptic region, chi zero. So it turns out that if you have a function and micro is a zero thing, then uh, these equations will be elliptic because it's bad direction. Remember we had this up square operator, square sub B operator, which is sort of, looks like it's elliptic if you ignore the direction T. The thing that prevents it from being elliptic is T. But um, if you cut that out, then you have an elliptic operator. So uh, there are these three micro localization. So now I, I'm not going to read this stuff. I don't think it's going to make sense. But it's all written down here, uh, where we have the splitting. Of course, my trouble here is that I know that I'm speaking to an audience which has some real experts in this, and are going to be uh, bored by this. And then I'm sure, then I'm sure that people that don't work in this stuff don't know anything about it and they're not going to understand the word. So I'm a little uh, confused how to proceed, but anyway, let me go on. Um, so anyway, uh, so let's, now that we have this micro plus is the thing that 
we're going to only talk about plus. It turns out zero, uh, the zero thing is elliptic. So the, not, everything is, uh, yeah. So here's the idea. The idea is that if we, if we understand, uh, we, we want to go beyond these Sobolev estimates to Helder estimates and other things. And these things behave, as long as you are in C2, you can sort of separate them nicely, but in higher dimensions, they behave quite differently in different pieces uh, according to the microlocalization. So we want to illustrate that. I want to say, uh, 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 yeah, so we want to illustrate that and give a kind of a model for this microorganization of very special domains, not more for them, very special domains of this defined like this. Uh, hopefully uh, these special domains will, uh, very special triangle domains will, uh, will uh, um, illustrate what happens in general. Uh, I will be generalized to to, uh, will be these arguments will be general, put into the general case. But uh, here, so here we have, uh, see, we have this, this is the half estimate, but it's, this would be, if this wasn't here, then you would have a half estimate. I mean, you have, remember, if you have this absolute value of T to a half, that's the, uh, on the plus sign and, and also on the minus sign, then you would have, and you wouldn't have this thing, then you would have the full half Sobolev estimate. But you have this factor, which, which is zero, and you somehow have to get rid of it. And of course, our only tool that we have in our toolbox is integration by parts. So anyway, uh, let me, and, then, and that's what we do in the, in the theorems I mentioned before. Now, I want to get to a real, much more specific thing. And this is just to sort of whet the appetites or the criticisms or whatever of those people around here who are experts in the subject. Uh, and um, so I consider very special uh, things, which are called, but this kind of stuff has been, Studied by uh, by D'Angelo quite a bit. Uh, he, has, he has many examples and interesting things to say. Anyway, let's take a general thing. You take these H's. So the first one of them depends just on Z1. The second one just depends on Z1 and Z Z2, but Z2, but uh, and the other one just on Z1 up to ZL. But the elf part is just depends on ZL like this. So the uh, question is to get really accurate, very extremely accurate microlocal estimates so that you can then pass uh, on to uh, Helder estimates and LP estimates and so on. Now, some of the <laughs> dimension uh, in C2, this is a rather, uh, uh, this thing is not so complicated and it can, has been done generally. Uh, I've worked on it uh, with this uh, microlocalization technique and then, uh, uh, then uh, using this microlocalization technique, technique, technique uh, Mike Christ has done a wonderful job uh, proving LP estimates and Pfefferman and I proved Helder estimates uh, I put down some references here on this thing's got erased. Ah, uh, let's see now. We can go further. I hope this thing goes further somehow. Uh, there we are. So here, okay. Now I'm. I don't think I should read this. <laughs> anyway, thing is to do is to you can right away get an estimate for this. Sort of going backwards, you know the. They say that you know, now, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it's sort of hard. In some ways, it's harder to go
go up the stairs going backwards and for, then going forwards, but here we go backwards. So I want to prove an estimate like this and find out what this is, is epsilon one. So I assume that I have any epsilon one and I do all, do all this stuff. And I find that if I set, uh, so I, uh, I do all these calculations and I find that if I set epsilon one equal to P one minus one, and uh, I mean, M equal to P one minus one, then I get this epsilon one equal to one over two P, one over two P one. And so in that, Microlocalization in the first direction, we get this. Now, it gets much more complicated for the second direction, but by real torches, even more torches, integration by parts, you can prove, uh, you can prove estimates. Oops, damn it. What's happening here? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to drive me crazy. So, no. Now, I think more. I have some more references down there, but since I seem to have lost it, are you there? Am I, am I audible still? Yes, I will just uh, uh, stop sharing the image, but we can see you directly. Yeah, but now I can't uh, find my screen. Uh, this is driving me crazy, but we're more pretty much at the end. I think we're down to the situation where only people who are, who have been working in this thing, and there may be a few, half a dozen or maybe less than half a dozen here. I don't quite see them. Um, and the other ones also, maybe I should, the best thing is to do to quit uh, at this point. What do you think? Answer questions if you want. Yes, we can go to the question section. And don't go read, yeah, at the end, we're going to publish some special uh, articles about these conferences. So yeah. you will have time to prepare everything. Yeah, I, 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 I will. I will clean it up and write it up nicely. As I yes, say, indeed. I've had, I've had <laughs> great helpers with the Zoom, uh, yes. three great helpers actually. Yeah. We, will, we will be very happy to have your final presentation and to publish it in the papers. But well, does anybody has any question? Any questions? No questions, so. No, it seems to be the no question. I don't know if it's a bad sign or a good sign, but anyway. <laughs> Well, I just have a small uh, philosophical question. Yeah. That some time ago, Professor Gotti and myself were uh, discussing about which should be the Laplacian, the natural Laplacian on a non Kähler manifold. Uh, Professor Gotti prefers to work with the Laplace Beltrami operator, and I prefer to work with the principal part, just the square section not uh, the first degree or second degree. What do you think in this philosophical setting? Uh, well, just offhand, I don't think the principal part will do it. I think you need the lower order terms. But uh, oh my goodness. This is just a guess. Yes, because it's, the principal part is the easy part. The calculations are very easy. Yeah, yeah, it's the easy part, but, but you know, um, it's very tricky business, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for your opinion. Seems to be that uh, I am lazy trying to do the calculations with the lower order terms. Okay. But well, thank you for your opinion, Professor. Okay. I suppose I have, that. Yes, I have a, yeah, I have a question here in, in, in Berkeley. Hi, Joe. Hi. Hi, um, is, it, is it your hope that the triangular case, is, it, is this intended to be important, um, an important collection of examples or is it your hope that this will somehow build to the, the general case? I hope it will build, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happened, what happened with triangular case, maybe I didn't emphasize enough in the case, in the thing. There was a problem of whether this, uh, whether this procedure that I have is effective, can be made effective right this ideals and uh, sue uh, really latched onto the problem and and solved in this kind of special case that i did now and then uh, with a kind of a complicated thing and then the a, a really remarkable paper that just came out by kim zaitsev and kim and zaitsev uh really nailed it down 
And now, uh, but in the case, both of Sue and, and Zaitsev, the micro, the micro organization isn't precise enough to be able to do the kind of stuff that you did and, and we did in the, in the C, um, in the C2 situation, right? Because we, we were able to just do one single micro localization somehow and everything worked nicely with the commutators, etc. But uh, here, as you can see in this example, you, you have different components of different micro organization uh, things. Some of them are much better than others. It's not only the, it's not only the sub elliptic one and the elliptic one, but there's a lot of, a lot of different sub elliptic ones. So I'm hoping, first of all, I'm hoping that one can pull the kind of trick that you pulled in, in um, for the, uh, for the LP estimates and the Pepperminari for other estimates, that kind of maneuver in this situation. And the second one I hope is, and I'm encouraging the Angelo, who is a real expert, to help me with this, uh, is, to, is to try and show how general this is, these special triangle domains, because these are, these are nasty, these special triangle domains, as complicated as they are, they're much simpler than the unit, than Mm -hmm. just triangle domains and those are special already so uh, uh, so I need I need someone who knows more much more algebraic geometry than I do to be able to see how far one one can one can go for example I, I have no idea uh, how you know if you have a variety uh, how uh, so you have an ideal with a bunch of generators and all you're allowed to do is to uh, pick new generators. How can you pick different generators that have nice properties, you know, with say by changing variables or something uh, and doing, of course, linear algebra, but not, not, uh, not allowing radicals, not allowing anything. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's a problem in algebraic geometry. I, I, I think there's some hope. Also, um, I don't know. So, uh, I don't know, Mike, but uh, I'm hoping. So Thank you. you. So you, you're looking good, uh, just as I remember you. I've got all this stuff in my nose, as you see. I've got uh, some troubles here, but maybe I can, maybe I can come over. Good to see you, anyway. Good to see you. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. I guess we should. Turn it back to the organizers here. Okay, so please yeah. stop recording and thanks a lot, Professor. It was a real beautiful pleasure. <laughs>